Well, over the last four weeks, uh, I've tried to impress upon you that Jesus is looking for followers, not fans. He's, he's looking for participants, not spectators. He, he's looking for travelers, not tourists, because real followers really follow. So I want to take you back to Luke chapter 14, and if you start in there, you go to verse 25, Jesus gives a teaching on real followers, a, a real disciple, and what a real disciple is. Jesus uses the same words in both these parables. He, he uses these, sit down first, in describing the man who built a tower, and then a man who deliberates a war. And in effect, Jesus is saying to each and one of us that when you are considering the idea of becoming a disciple, a real follower of his, pull up a chair and have a seat. And from that seated position, Jesus is saying, let's talk about being a real follower and what that means for you and for your life. Let's talk about it, what it means, and let's calculate the cost. Let's consider it together. Real followers have engaged in the math equation, the math issue of following Jesus. Real followers have learned to count. Let me read this to you, starting with verse 28, Luke 14. Jesus says, For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then... None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Listen to me, Jesus gives back-to-back -back parables here. He, he doubles his emphasis with his last point in meaning that you and I should sit up. We should pop up. We should come to attention as he's saying. Jesus is saying, I'm not only going to tell you this once. I'm going to tell you this twice so that you actually get it. So take notice, stay awake, pay attention, in other words. This is important. So I want us to look at these parables and see what we can learn about doing the math ourselves, calculating the cost. I first want you to notice that these, in these two parables, the first note is this. He says, let's sit down and talk. Let's sit down first. That appears in both. Both the first parable and the second one, sit down first. And then he says in the first one, he says, calculate the cost. In the second one, he says, consider the price. So picture this, if you will, for with me today. Jesus is sitting in his chair, and you are sitting directly in front of him in your chair. And he brings up examples of other disciples' commitment to him. He begins with a man by the name of John G. Lake. And John G. Lake's commitment, and he says to you, now look at this. John G. Lake had, and his churches had 125 missionaries, 125 pastors in the fields of South Africa in the early 1900s. They were very, a, a very young institution, a very young church startup. They weren't very big. They were not very well known in the world. And one day, certain men from England and America who did not like John G. Lake began to spread rumors about him. And because of that, finances went to an all-time low as people withdrew their support for this ministry. It was then that John G. Lake was only able to send $10 a month to his preachers, his missionaries out in the field. Things got even worse to the point where he could only send $2 a month. John G. Lake didn't want to have that kind of responsibility on these men and their wives and their children, their families, out in this wicked frontier with those kind of conditions. His staff at the headquarters, they sold their clothes, they sold 
their jewelry. They sold pieces of furniture. One person even sold their house. And what they did was they called all 125 missionaries back to the conference, to the headquarters for a conference. John G. Lake was invited by a committee at that conference to leave the room because they wanted to speak privately and with each other. He went across the street to a cafe, had a cup of coffee, waited there for a little while, and then went back to the conference. When John G. Lake came back in, he found all the chairs in the conference room were arranged into an oval, and at one end there was a little table, and on that little table was the bread and the wine. An older leader by the name of Mr. Vanderwall, speaking for the whole company, said, Brother Lake, during your absence, we have come to a conclusion. We have made our decision. We want you to serve the Lord's Supper because we are going back to our fields. We are going back even if we have to walk. We are going back if we have to starve. We are going back if our wives die. We are going back if our children die. We are going back if we die ourselves. The only thing we ask is but one request. If we die, will you come and bury us? The next year, John G. Lake buried 12 men, 16 wives and children. Lake sadly recounted there was not one of them. If they had had a few of the things a white man needs to eat, but what they would, might have lived. That is the kind of consecration, that is the kind of discipleship that established Pentecost in South Africa. Now, from your seated position in front of Jesus, he asks you the question, do you still want to be a follower? Do you still want in? Sit down first means that some thought should go into the front side of the question. Do you want to be a real follower? The discussion, the, the decision to become a follower of Jesus must be made thoughtfully and carefully. How different that is from the evangelism that we see here in this western part of the world. We preach a message, we have an altar call, we pray the sinner's prayer and those people respond and we give them a get out of hell free card. And then ask them to get plugged into a church. We think that's it. We now fit church services into our routine. We don't cuss, smoke, drink, or kick the cat anymore. We think that's the substance of this Christian life. But being a real follower is more than that. It requires an informed decision, not an inflamed decision. An informed decision, not an emotional decision. A decision made by deliberation. A decision made by confronting the question, just what exactly is it going to cost me? And then being okay with the answer. Those 125 missionaries did exactly what Jesus said here in the parable at their conference. They sat down, they did the math, they counted the cost, they were okay with the results. What was the result of this level of discipleship? Was it in vain? In five years' time, 1912, in South Africa, they went from one preacher, one missionary, to 1,250, 625 churches, and 100,000 converts. From that seated position, Jesus continues and introduces you to Adoniram Judson, missionary to Burma. Adoniram Judson was the first Baptist foreign missionary appointed by a missionary society in the United States. Adoniram Judson sweated out Burma's extreme heat for 18, 18 years without a furlough. He arrived in Burma with his wife in July of 1813. He didn't baptize his first convert until June of 1819. Six years without one person being saved. He endured torture. He endured imprisonment. He admitted that he never saw a ship sail without wanting to jump on board and just go home. 
when his wife's health broke and he put her on a homebound vessel in the knowledge that he would not see her for two full years. He confided this in his diary. If we could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could spend the rest of our days in peace. But he studied himself with this remarkable postscript. Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I am almost the only person on earth who has attained their language to communicate salvation. If you're married, what do you think about that level of commitment? Here's a person who stayed behind to win souls for Jesus Christ knowing that he wasn't going to see his wife for two full years. And now, from your seated position, right in front of Jesus, Jesus asks you the question, do you still want to be a follower? What are we doing here? We're calculating the cost. We are considering we are bouncing these stories off our heart. You can make a commitment to God in the privacy of your prayer closet, but you must count the cost. What is it going to cost me to commit to being a real follower? Mark it down. Run it through your head. Get it into your heart because you want to count the cost. Why? Because a religion that costs nothing is worth nothing. And is it worth committing to? Here's the thought for you to consider. If may, instead of making it so easy to join a church, maybe we should make it harder. In Russia, Christians are tested by hardship. But in America, you're tested by freedom. And testing by freedom is much harder. Nobody pressures you about your religion. So you relax and aren't so concentrated on Christ, on his teaching, how you are to live your life. Being tested by freedom is much harder because you have a choice. When you're tested by hardship, there is no choice. Jesus tells you to look at the cost involved in following him. Before you follow him, make an informed assessment. As to what it is going to cost. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. Hmm. Lukewarm is not the picture Jesus is showing you. As you're seated right in front of him. It's not an option. I want you to note the person that drifts along uncommitted is the person Jesus says will be rejected. Following Jesus demands high personal cost. Isn't marriage supposed to be that way? Doesn't marriage demand high personal cost? Do the words until death do us part mean anything anymore? Marriage is not to be entered into unadvisedly, but reverently, discreetly, and in the fear of God. Being a real follower is to be entered into in the same way, the same manner. Serving God demands high personal cost. Several centuries ago, in a mountain village in Europe, there was a very wealthy nobleman who wanted to leave a legacy for all the townspeople. And so he thought and thought about what he could do to inspire them and to leave this legacy. And he made a real good decision. He decided to build them a church. No one was permitted to see the plans beforehand. No one was able to see the inside of the church until it was completely finished. And at its grand opening, the people all gathered and they marveled at, at this beautiful, beautiful new church. Everything had been thought of. Everything had been included. It was a total masterpiece. But then someone said, wait a minute. Where are the lamps? It's really quite dark in here. How will the church be lighted? 
And the nobleman pointed to some side brackets on the exterior walls, and then he gave each family a lamp, which they were to bring with them each time they came to worship. Each time you're here, the nobleman said, the place where you are seated will be lit. Each time you are not here, the place will be dark. This is to remind you that whenever you fail to come to church, some part of God's house will be dark. It's an emotionally disturbing story, isn't it? It makes a very significant point about the importance of our commitment to the, and loyalty to the bride of Christ, the church. The poet Edward Everett Hale put it like this, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something I can do. Here's another question for you. Let me see if I can put it another way. What if every member of our church supported the church just the same way that you do? What kind of church would we have? What if every Christian was like you in your current level of discipleship? What kind of body would Jesus have here on earth? What if every single member served God the way you're serving Him? What if they gave in the offering like you're giving in the offering? What if they read their Bible and prayed like you do? What kind of church would it be? What if every believer attended the church, loved the church, shared the church, and gave the church exactly as you do? What kind of church would we have? Please remember, Jesus is sitting right in front of you waiting for you to think this through. And while he's sitting there, he brings up one last person, John Huss. John Huss was a Bohemian reformer. He was a man who believed that the scriptures were the infallible, inerrant, supreme authority in all matters. He was Martin Luther's hero. He was excommunicated by the church at Rome because he believed that Jesus Christ was the head of the church, not the Pope. A council was called at Constance, Germany in 1414 to discuss the reform of the church. John Huss was invited to attend and he was given, he was given complete promise by Emperor Sigismund that he would have completely safe passage through Germany. But a few weeks after he arrived in Constance, Germany, he was arrested by soldiers and he was thrown into prison. It was regarded as justifiable by the religious order of the day to break a promise to a heretic. The cell in which he was thrown into was right next to a sewer system and John Huss became violently ill. He was then transferred from that cell into a cage where he was kept in dreadful conditions for about two months. And then he was burned at the stake for his belief in the Word of God in Constance, Germany on his 42nd birthday. As he refused a final plea to renounce his faith, John Huss's last words were, What I taught with my lips, I seal with my blood. One last time, from your seated position in front of Jesus, he asked you the question, Do you still want to be a real follower? Are you willing to believe what you say you believe about my word as strong as John Huss did? And it finally dawns as you, on you as you're sitting there with Jesus that grace is free. But it's not cheap. 
You finally realize that salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you everything. You have to do the math. Your heart wants to do the math. Your heart wants to count the cost. Your heart wants to pay the price. This appeals to your spirit. Your heart hungers to be completely sold out follower of Jesus Christ. Go ahead. Check on the inside. Those of you who are still awake. It's there. Check in your spirit. And you know that a a hunger is inside of you. A deep desire is within you to be God's favorite child, completely wrapped up in Him. There was a woman who asked her minister, will you please tell me in a word what your idea of consecration is? Holding out a blank sheet of paper, the pastor replied, it is to sign your name at the bottom of this blank sheet And to let God fill it in as He will. The people that go to the head of the class are those who day in and day out, day in and day out, pay the price by allowing God to fill in their blank sheet. This is calculating the cost. Signing off on a blank sheet of paper and saying to him, God, my life is yours. Fill in the blank according to your purpose. Because, my friends, real followers really follow. Will you pray with me? Father, sometimes we get so led astray by all the bells and the whistles. We lose track of what's important to you. We focus our intention on so many things that are here today and gone tomorrow. We exert so much energy in programs And very little in relationships. We know what you say about being a disciple. About being a follower. About counting the cost. About sitting down and taking an assessment of our life. Asking the hard question. Facing an honest answer. Too often, we fall so short. Maybe it's because of our freedom. Maybe it's because of uh, those around us. Maybe it's because we've never really made a commitment. We've let everybody else. And today, you're asking us if we really want to follow, not our way, but your way. Holy Spirit, I pray that each man and woman in this room, their answer to that question is yes. I want to follow. I want to follow Yahweh, your way. Father, start with me. Start with each one of us. must be a church of real followers in your holy precious name